What if I told you that social stress doesn't just mess with your head, it damages your DNA and biologically ages you? That's not hyperbole, it's not exaggeration. It's based on science from new data published in the journal Nature Aging. And if you're like me, juggling a life full of psychological stress, you might be wondering, how can I, how can you, how can we fight back against the age accelerant effects of stress? Stick with me, because by the end of this video, I'll share three tips to help you turn these lemon of data into practical mind hacking and biology hacking lemonade, including a powerful randomized control trial backed breathing technique that could take just five minutes per day and could help you combat the harmful effects of stress on your biology. And make sure to stick around to the end to hear directly from the first author, Dr. Carrie Lyons herself. But moving on, I wanna give you background on aging. Aging is complex and there's no one easy way to measure biological age. It's a little bit of a fluffy term. However, certain hallmarks of aging, like DNA damage, telomere shortening, and cellular senescence are widely recognized. Senescence is the focus of this paper. And it's a process by which cells age and permanently stop dividing. Senescent cells accumulate as we age and play roles in chronic diseases like heart disease and Alzheimer's disease, dementia. Now, while senescence does have some adaptive functions, I want to put that out there, for our purposes, it's fair to call senescence a hallmark of aging. Now, senescence can be triggered by various pathological processes, including inflammation and DNA damage, which we'll also tap on later. And senescence can be measured using markers like P16, which is the focus of this paper. And if you want to remember this, just imagine the stress of having a pissed off 16 year old kid. I don't know, I don't have a teenager of my own, but I can imagine it's stressful. Anyway, in this study, the researchers subjected mice to chronic social stress, or more specifically, chronic subordination stress. The experimental mouse is exposed to an aggressive dominant mouse every single day. The human equivalent of chronic subordination stress, chronic social stress, will be like a bully at school, or an abusive parent, or a hyper-aggressive boss. And in just four weeks, the experimental mouse, the one that got bullied, exhibited increases in markers of senescence, predominantly P16, this marker I mentioned earlier. And this marker of senescence and biological aging accumulated over time, with levels getting to as high as 12 times that of control mice by 26 months of age in circulating blood cells, as you can see here. But if only it were just circulating blood cells. The researchers then found something really scary. The cell type most sensitive to stress-induced senescence were neurons in the brain. You can see that here, red, marks senescent cells, the P16 labeled cells, and you can see they're massively increased in mice subjected to chronic subordination, chronic social stress, that's the red bar. And they found evidence consistent with the hypothesis that the senescence and presumed biological aging were triggered by DNA damage, which can be measured by a marker called gamma H2AX. It's not very important, but that's what you see here a massive increase in DNA damage in chronic subordination, chronic social stress, and an increase in inflammation. So to summarize quickly, chronic social stress causes DNA damage and inflammation in association with increases in a marker of senescence and biological age, that P16 we talked about. And this occurred especially in the brain's neurons. Pretty scary, right? And it's also worth noting chronic social stress is also associated with overeating and weight gain, cardiovascular, neuroimmune, and metabolic diseases, including in humans. So the signs of biological damage tend to align with clinical hard outcomes. Stress is an age accelerator. In five words, that's the summary. Stress is an age accelerator. And as a brief aside, a nuanced note, there were other nuances in this paper, different senescence markers they used, like P21, SA beta gal, etc., and different responses in different non-social stress models, potential sex-dependent differences, and so on. So if you want to read the paper, I always encourage it. But I'm going to put those aside for now, because I want to discuss the so what and suggest practical solutions that don't involve quitting your job if your boss is a jerk. So combating stressors, tip one, awareness matters. Awareness is the first step in adaptation. And now that you've watched this video, 
you have a biological handhold for awareness. I think even or especially when the data are scary, as they are here, I find awareness offers the motivation to seek change. Now, by way of a personal analogy, when I found out I carry not one, but two risk genes for Alzheimer's disease, two copies of the ApoE4 allele, at first I was honestly freaked out. Alzheimer's scares the shit out of me, sorry. But then I realized this was always in me. But having the knowledge, especially early on in life, it's a gift. It's the motivation and power to take every preventative action. In the end, you can achieve the best outcome in a given scenario. I can't change my genes, but I can change what I do in life and the impact those genes will have on manifesting into reality. And the same goes true for these data on stress and biological aging. So tell me in the comments, do you agree knowledge and awareness is power? Anyway, moving on, combating stressors tip two, a growth mindset. Stress is not all bad. Stress forces you to adapt. And the balance of research shows it's not about what the stressor is. It's about how you respond to the stressor. And if you can find a way to adopt a growth mindset in a situation, focus on the positives and focus on your purpose, that's huge. Now, you can skip forward to the next chapter if you don't want to waste time on me rambling about myself. But again, I'm going to share a little bit of a personal example in case that resonates with anybody. So as a personal example, I've been subject to academic harassment and academic bullying over the course of my still young academic career. I'm not going to share with you the specifics. That's not really important. But to me, this is worse than physical bullying. In a physical altercation, I can punch back if I need to, when I need to. But when someone exerts their academic seniority in a very hierarchical system, especially in medicine, to attack your career, hitting up the hierarchy can sometimes create more pain for you than for the aggressor. Now, the instance I have in mind, it tore me up inside. But ultimately, I did find contentment in a growth mindset. Here, I mean, I internalized the truth that the event as it transpired was initiated by an unforced error on my part. I think I did the right thing ethically, but I did it in a way that left me vulnerable to attack. In retrospect, that was dumb, but it taught me not to assume that others will play fair. And that was a valuable lesson about a harsh reality that I'll carry forward with me. The issue is now resolved, thankfully, and I'm wiser for it. So I should be, and I am grateful for the experience. Also, I focused my energy on my purpose. I'm doing an MD PhD. Actually, I'm a few months away from finishing it after 11 years of higher education, but I'm doing this for you because I love science, teaching, conducting research that can change lives. The practical value of Oxford and Harvard brands and MD, PhD, those letters, it's immense. And I know I will soon be in a position to leverage those credentials for the greater good. This world's metabolic health. Now, to be clear, I am not saying letters and brands should be used as a lever for credibility. I am just acknowledging the realities of our social structure and being transparent that I will play the game that needs to be played in order to make metabolic health mainstream. And the only reason I'm verbalizing this to you now in a video is because I promise myself and you authenticity. So I'd like to take moments aside to present that to you. Anyway, now moving on, tip three, moving back to the science, tip three for combating stressors is the physiologic sigh. And this might be the most practical of all. So try practicing a physiologic sigh for just five minutes per day. This is a structured breathing technique characterized by two stacked inhales followed by a long exhale. So a one second inhale stacked by a quarter second inhale, then a two second exhale, like. This physiologic sigh form of breathing is actually a method that Andrew Huberman turned me on to. You may have heard him talk about it. And it's backed by science. In fact, in a randomized control trial published in Cell Reports Medicine, Researchers, I'll tell you who those were in a moment, compared three forms of breathing, a physiologic sigh, box breathing, and cyclic hyperventilation. And they compared this to meditation. And in short, they found that the physiologic sigh performed best overall at increasing positive affect, reducing anxiety, and improving physiological markers like respiratory rate. Furthermore, the benefits of daily physiologic sigh for just five minutes per day accumulated as people engaged in the practice for more days. 
So now, quoting from the paper, we, the research team, found that the cyclic physiologic side group had significantly higher increases in positive affect as compared to those in the mindfulness meditation group. Cyclic physiologic sighing also had a significant interaction with cumulative days on protocol compared with mindfulness meditation, suggesting subjects, those engaged in physiologic size, benefited more from the exercise the more days they did it, an effect that was not observed in other groups. Now I want to pause for another brief aside, this one on Andrew Huberman himself. One thing I'll note is that Andrew Huberman was the senior author on this paper in Cell Reports Medicine. And I want to note that because you'll notice, if you follow him, Andrew promotes a lot of research, but rarely if ever self-cites. Now this is rare, especially given his position, where he does have the influence to crank up metrics on his own research. He can do that easily, but he chooses not to. And I don't think anyone else has ever before publicly observed this quirk in Huberman's character. So let me be the first, as I think it speaks to his honestly humble character, and that deserves credit, at least in my opinion it does. It's sometimes hard to know the authentic person behind the brand, especially when fame invites vicious attacks. Sometimes they're warranted, sometimes they're outright lies. And how are you, as a member of the general public, to know the difference? So take this observation for what it's worth. Again, I thought it deserves some credit, because I can't think of another single famous researcher who intentionally avoids promoting their own work. It's interesting, at the very least. Do you agree? Anyway, moving on and in conclusion, I want to end this presentation by speaking to a key question about resilience to consider as this research progresses. Now, it's highly likely there are differences in vulnerability to stress-induced senescence, the topic of this paper. And the flip side of this coin is resilience to stressors, biological resilience to stressors. But what makes one more resilient is it about psychology, mindset, or is it primarily metabolic? In fact, in this paper, they note that chronic social stress, the chronic subordination stress, activates known inflammatory pathways, like those stimulated by the NLRP3 inflammasome, which can be inhibited by practices like fasting or ketogenic diets, which generate the molecule beta-hydroxybutyrate, which inhibits the NLRP3 inflammasome. So in theory, certain dietary or lifestyle practices could build resilience to social stress in terms of senescence. My hypothesis is that lifestyle practices, including diet, sleep, and exercise, contribute to biological resilience to social stress. And this highlights their importance in our stress-filled world. Because honestly, Stress isn't going away anytime soon. So now I'll ask you, what's your first step? Will you try a physiologic side, reevaluate your stress response, or focus on improving your sleep or diet? Take one small step today, and then another tomorrow. Your future self will thank you. And now here are some thoughts from the first author of this paper, Dr. Carrie Lyons, recorded exclusively for you. Thank you, Nick, for reaching out about our research. The data from our study are exciting because they directly link psychological stress to promoting a fundamental aspect of aging, which is cellular senescence. For a long time, people have had the idea that intense stress accelerates aging, but we didn't really know what biologically was happening to cause this. The study that we recently published found that over time stress, especially social stress, increases the abundance of senescent cells, and that the first systems where this can be measured are the brain and in circulating blood cells. While our studies were performed in mice, a large body of research has shown that social adversity affects health and lifespan across species, from mice to monkeys to dolphins to humans. In people, multiple types of social stress, including low socioeconomic status, loneliness, and caregiving for a chronically ill loved one are associated with greater risk of developing aging-associated diseases. So we believe that we can learn a lot about human health in regards to social stress from animal studies like ours. For more on the topic of what seems to be an evolutionarily conserved relationship between social interactions, health, and aging, I'd point folks towards two review articles that I'll link for you. The first was published in the journal Science in 2020. First author is Noah Snyder-Mackler. 
The second I published with my group in 2023 in Neuroscience and Biobehavioral Reviews, and it aggregates the current evidence we have from human, animal, and cell studies showing a link between stress and aging. The other side of the coin of stress research is research into resilience. This research shows that having supportive social relationships predicts better health outcomes in humans and in other species. Additionally, when we talk about stress from a scientific point of view, we're thinking about challenges that the subject experiences as being both uncontrollable and unpredictable. Health studies in humans have shown that people who feel a strong sense of control in their lives, even if they are experiencing social adversity, don't have the same negative health outcomes as people who don't feel that sense of control. I mention this not as a personal admonishment to anyone to take control of their lives, but is something to be conscious of looking at our own feelings and how we make others feel through our interactions and through institutional and public policies. Because I do think that social stress should be regarded as a public health concern. Underlying the negative effects of social stress on health, I believe that there are both psychological and metabolic components at play. I'll add that these factors likely interact with each other and could create a bit of a positive feedback loop or have a snowball effect. The next steps for our research can be divided into two main lines of inquiry. The first would look at interventions that promote resilience to social stress-induced senescence. One might be providing our stressed mice with positive, non-aggressive social interactions with other mice. In terms of interventions more focused on the metabolic side, my PhD advisor was always very interested in diet and specifically caloric restriction, while I've always been very interested in exercise given its demonstrated ability to improve both psychological health and metabolic health. Secondly, we would like to look more closely at the specific long-term health consequences of social stress-induced senescence. This could be accomplished by exposing mice modeling a certain disease, maybe atherosclerosis, maybe Alzheimer's disease, to social stress while giving them either a placebo or an agent to kill senescent cells, and then seeing how both the stress and then the removal of senescent cells affects their disease progression. 